Um, this is the um, writing for animation panel. The first panel I've been on at this convention that is both in, oh, actually, no. It's the panel that's in the room that was scheduled in, but not at the time they told us it was going to be. My last panel was in the room at the right time, but in the wrong room. But, um, that's right. Um, so anyway, I'm, we're going to start by having each member of the panel introduce themselves. We'll do some, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions to get a sense of what you want to hear, and then we'll start talking. Um, why don't we start on my far left with Stan Berkowitz. Hi. Um, closer to... I've written for Warner Brothers Animation, a lot of uh, superhero stuff. Okay, uh, brief and to the point. Next to him is Dean Steffen. Hi, I'm Dean Steffen, and um, I started out in animation, gosh, we were just talking about it, almost 27 years ago. I started at Hanna Barbera, one of the few shows they did last season of Smurfs, and I was on the Disney Afternoon for five years, which we did shows like Chip and Dale and Dark Horse Duck and Goop Troop and Tailspin and all that stuff, and then I went to um, Sony and Story or Coach Story Aid, Extreme Ghostbusters, Jackie Chan Adventures, and the Black, a year at Nickelodeon, do a cat dog instead of writing and to um, uh, Mike Young and Cartoon Network. Mattel for He Man and Masters of the Universe reboot. That was the head writer on that in the early 2000s. Went back to Disney in the mid 2000s for my friends Tigger and Blue, a young show, and uh, now I'm here. And uh, looking for any job opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> to my right, Bob Skier. Hi, I'm Bob Skier. I was one of the writers on the original X Men series of Fox. I developed X Men Evolution. I've written for um, X Men Beast Machines and The Mask and Extreme Ghostbusters. And I also teach animation writing at UCLA. And my name, as I said, is Craig Miller. I've been writing animation since the mid-80s. I started on The Real Ghostbusters, a show that, and then, an, then I moved to another show that I'm always surprised that people know called The Bionic Six. Always surprised that there he is. Um, I wrote three, the three Real Ghostbusters its first season and ten Bionic Six. And then I worked on the last two seasons of the Smurfs. Um, Curious George, Beast Wars, Godzilla, um, all kinds of different shows, and I do a lot of development and writing for companies internationally. I've done shows in China, France, Italy, Australia, Latin America, and stuff like that. So that's who I am. Um, and now I want to find out who you are. We'll go one by one. Um, <laughs> How many of you, since this is the writing for animation panel, how many of you have written animation? Okay. And I assume the rest of you either want to write animation or are sitting next to someone who wants to write animation. Or the writer from the Metro Alliance. Or if you're just interested in animation. Or are just interested in animation. They're big Dean Stephan fans. <laughs> Okay, um, I think um, one question that people always ask is how did you get started? So um, let's answer that question briefly. How did you get started writing animation? Oh, Stan? Well, well my, my story is not typical because I was doing live action. So the question is how do you do live action when you start animation? How do you get into the get kicked out of five action and wind up in animation? Yeah, there's a point to my answer. Just go ahead and tell me after the story. Getting into animation. Answer the question well, I asked you. <laughs> uh, I, I had a live action show called Superboy and then hadn't done anything for about a year. A friend of mine who, who I knew from Superboy is a fellow writer uh, called up and said there's a show called Spider Man. Simple 
atypical. I was a musician and songwriter, had a band, met a woman who was a fan of my songwriting. She later became a producer on Divorce Court, gave me a shot at writing for that. I had never seen a script before. I didn't know what it looked like. I started getting notes from the network. You might consider sitcoms because they're kind of funny. I took a sitcom extension class at UCLA. In the class, I met a guy named Mark Young who was story editor at Hanna-Barbera. He gave me my first shot at animation. And I just, um, been from there. I thought I would do it for six months and then find real writing work. But, you know, I, get, um, I kept getting work, so I, I, I stayed with it. Uh, um, I got a degree screenwriting from UCLA, and I was writing uh, various screenplays and monumental indifference. And then I uh, was working with a writing partner who was getting an assistant job over at Fox when we were starting Fox Kids. And the two of us were working on some screenplays together, and he suggested that we just try and pitch a few episodes of, uh, of Beetlejuice. Um, and they were toward the end of their run, so we got to write an episode. They turned into seven episodes out of a 65-episode run, so we wrote like over one-tenth of them which was rather amazing. And then uh, after that, they started developing X-Men, and I was a huge X-Men fan, so I was like, hey, let's, get, let's do this. So um, suddenly, we just kind of got all this traction. We were just working nonstop in animation, but we just sort of fell into it, which was kind of right. Um, we, we were in the right place at the right time, and we said, and we said yes when we had a chance to do something. And I had been working in, in Hollywood in the publicity and licensing consultants on live action feature film. And I wanted to get into something more creative and a friend of mine had been hired to be story editor on the new this new Ghostbusters show uh, based on the real Ghostbusters. And he said, you want to try writing one? And I said, okay. Back then we used to get orders for 65 half hours all at once. So it was a lot easier to take a chance on a new writer because if they screwed up, you had time to move that episode to the back end and rewrite it and slot other people in. But he gave me a chance. I pitched him some ideas. He bought the first one. I wrote it. I ended up doing two more for him and continued. And the point I want to make is there is no one way to get in. And everyone's story is, oh, I've got an atypical story. It's not like anyone else. I don't know anyone who has a typical story for writing animation. They're all different. They're all, you know. No, no, no two people got in the same way. And they're all, there was an opportunity and I took it. I was, I was looking for an opportunity. I found an opportunity and I was ready and I went forward. It sounds like the one thing, I could be wrong, that we all have in common is proximity. We were in the LA area. We knew people or we had an interest in film or TV. I think anytime you get into you know, I know people have gone in completely different directions. The guy I met who gave me the start in animation, he was taking the sitcom class because he wanted out of animation. So, you know, there's But he's still working in animation. Right. Scratch an animation, animation writer, you can either find a, 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 a wannabe sitcom writer or a wannabe um, movie writer, or somebody who's quite happy with their lot in life. You know, we call those mostly. So it, it's all it's all really, there isn't like, oh, I'll go take this class or I'll go sign up on the animation writer job board or anything else. It's all finding your way in by finding openings and getting ready. And that's something I wanted to stress for all of you guys who are not yet working in animation, who are, want to get in. You have to look for it, meet people, get to know people in the industry writers, producers, or just someone who's a receptionist, but who could help you find your way in. To, and then you have to show what you can do. It's always what you can do. Okay. I want to, we can, t there, writing animation is a big complicated thing, and we can talk at great length and never get to the areas you're interested in. So I just want to kind of pull the room quickly and let it, Put your hand up, let me, I'll call on a bunch of people and get an idea of the areas you would like to hear us talk about. Yeah. Moving from writing live action scripts to animated features. Okay. Ready, either action person or action. 
action comedy person that has that list. What, what do you mean when you say writing an action or action comedy? Like, let's say uh, if I'm going to write like a bad series. You don't have time, you don't have someone to give you that shout out. Uh, what are the difference in tone is what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. What are the best ways to meet those people who are in the industry? Because I am not local, or I was not local, now I'm living here. But I, since I'm not from here, I don't know too many people who are actually in the industry and working. Most of the people I know are all retired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so do we. We'll tell We'll, t you know, if you want to talk to us after, we'll tell you like about a few events, or, or you cool. Greg could certainly mention. No, it. We'll, we'll talk about that during the panel. But I, but I did want to say, just you being right here, you know, you're with people who are in the industry, so you know that's a good start. That's, that's a good yeah. place. Yeah. Yes. I would say that uh, animation has changed a lot in the last ten or fifteen years, thanks to like Cartoon Network and kind of like a more smart-ass sense of humor. If that makes sense. And how that how, how that's changed from the days of. You know, things I grew up with in the okay. 80s. Any, anyone else have an area? And, yeah. Um, writing style for types that are more successful than others. Good ones. I was just curious about the writer's room, or do you work independently, and how is that all? Okay, you know. and there was one more, and then we'll get started. Um, the difference between writing a script and writing a regular story is in something that would be in a book. Right, the difference between writing a script and writing prose? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, let, let me... Can I ask one question? Yes. How many of you are from the comic book world? Have you written or drawn for comic books, or that's your entree? Let, let me address uh, her point first about how you meet the people. Um, the, there are lots of events. There are conventions. There are organizations that put on gatherings, mixers, um, panels. And um, I used to teach writing for animation at the Art Institute of California. And I'd always tell my students, go to everything you can go to. Go to panels at conventions. Women in Animation, which is open to men as well, um, does panels, does, has a mixer every month for people to come. The mixers are free, the panels for non-members are $25, but it only costs $50 a year to join, so for $50 you get to go to the panels and have screenings and stuff. Um, there's a lot of different animation organizations that do events, like the C4 Hollywood, go to those places, meet people. There's a bunch of animation panels at this convention, or there were, I guess now there aren't any more. Um, but go up to people, talk to people in the audience, talk to some of the panelists, meet people that way. Go to all these things and meet people. That, that's really how you do it. Just, you have to go out there and you have to introduce yourself. Well, also there's a plug for Bob in form, your form of fashion, take classes. One of our other acquaintances, uh, Brooks, teaches a class in the extension. Um, UCLA extension. Yes, it's, uh, my alma mater too, as a matter of fact. And mine. Okay. UCLA extension is uh, adult education, so um, if you're not at UCLA, it doesn't matter. You can just, uh, um, just sign up and just take classes. I mean, classes in animation writing as well as pretty much anything else you want to take a class in. And it's not so much meeting the teachers, it's meeting the people who are your fellow students because that's what happened with me and probably you guys too. They started to have careers and you know, they, they, they were friends, but they also helped make connections and, and for you guys too. I had a similar experience before actually. The guy gave me a shot at Hanna Barbera. We formed like a little writing group out of, out of the class where we all kept in touch and we brought in pages every two weeks a week to each other. And so we stayed in, in touch and you know, some people, when I finally got a staff job at Disney and became a story editor, I was able to hire one of the guys I knew from that particular group, and you know it worked for me, and I was able to pass it on. So yeah, those people are somebody's going to have a career, and if you're in a good stead, you may uh, they may give you a shot, or vice versa, you may give them one. Yeah. Yeah. So.
So, so that I think is something that everyone can use. All everyone who's not working, and, and you know, it also works for once you've been established. You're still meeting new people, and people say, "Oh, I'm working on this new show, and I, I you know, and now I know you, and I'll, uh, you know, maybe you could work on it for me." So, it's a, it's an ongoing process of continuing to meet more and new people. Most writers, and this is probably true for a lot of you guys, are not extroverts by nature. You know, we're not going around partying and slapping backs and all that stuff. So if you're a quiet person, you know, I mean, we spend most of our time in dark little rooms by ourselves. So we're not, we're not gregarious people by nature. Yourself, I have a candle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do better than I do. Curse to me. <laughs> but, but the point is that just be yourself. You don't have to be, you know, some, you know, Paris Hilton type or something. Just be, you know, you know, showing up is 90% of the thing. You're sitting in the corner at a party, the person you're sitting next to turns out to be, you know, the vice president of, you know, Warner's or something, you know. So it, by the way, there's this wonderful nifty thing out there called social media. You can reach out to Facebook and various other ways to uh, look, look up who the writers are that you respect. Maybe you can contact them via Facebook, friend them, and just basically get to a conversation with them. Okay. Just don't stop me. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Time to get to um, do we work independently or in a writer's room? And while a couple of a couple of shows still have staff, well, prime time shows have staff writers who work together and feed out stories. Sitcoms, sitcoms yeah. have a room. Yes, right. Though those are run like live action sitcoms. Most daytime animation, which is what we mainly write, some of them have staff. Warner Brothers has had staff on and off. And, 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 and Disney has had staff. But, but most shows, I think, are written freelance. There'll be a story editor on staff who may or may not have an office at the company um, and who will take pitches and give assignments, and you'll go off and write by yourself, or if, with a, if you work with a partner, the two of you will go off and write. But it isn't, it isn't like watching you know, the Dick Van Dyke show and everyone's in an office coming up with sketches. Very, there's very little, uh, I think, like Phineas and Ferb and SpongeBob, because they're what you call board-driven shows. They're very gag-oriented. I think they do gather and do sort of the sitcom equivalent of room writing. But there's no, you know, war room kind of writing. Usually, I mean, my recent freelance experience from a few years ago, I wanted to work on an episode of Penguins in Madagascar. So I went in, I met with the story editors, I pitched them ideas. They actually said you could send them in by email, but I'm a firm believer, get in front of somebody's face, you know, it's harder to say no, and you could also read their body language. They gave me an assignment. First, they had to run a creditor check because all the Viacom companies, they had some molestation several years ago, so they, they run a check on you, Sorry, even though what? even though I'm never going to see anybody but those story editors ever again, because of some live action. It's production. just him. It's just him. <laughs> and he used to work for yeah. Well, Nickelodeon. And yeah, but, but anyway, they run a check. Mental note: Do not be a predator. <laughs> yeah, don't be a predator. If you are, make sure you got you know. Never. <laughs> Tangent. The point point being that that's the last contact I had with them in person. Then I send in my flushed out version of the premise. They email me back with notes or call, and it goes that. Then you go to outline. Same process. You get notes. They, you, they either ask you to rewrite it, or they rewrite it themselves, or they ask you to rewrite it five times, which could happen. Not that often. Then you go to script. First draft. They give you notes, possibly. You give them a version. They polish it. They send it up the food chain. That's still first draft. Then get notes back, they may take it from you at that point, meaning that it's so internal and the changes are easier to make than for you to make. But basically in what we do, premise, outline, script, you know, and the premise is the part where you pitch and they can have you write for free in animation. That's a dirty little secret, but they get free writing from you to, you know, a story idea. And at that point, half the oh, Nickelodeon now. Okay, let's, that's, that's we're, we're, we're way off the actual question at this point. So oh, yeah. the short answer is 
There are occasional writing staffs. Mostly it's done independently. The storyboard-driven shows, their dirty secret is they have writers working independently writing outlines. And then the outlines are given to the clever and inventive storyboard artists who do the shows completely on their own without the use of any writers and they board and ex then they expand it and they put in the dialogue and stuff from the storyboard. But they all work from written outlines that some anonymous person who doesn't exist gave to them. <laughs> At least in the mythos of board driven shows. But I mean, you, you know, you're employed, you get credit and all that. But they like to pretend that it's all done by the storyboard artists. And a lot of Nickelodeon shows are done that way, and Phineas and Ferb was done that way. Um, By the way, when you're working off on your own, when you're working with a story editor and you're working independently, um, it's really kind of awesome, because you can make your own um, hours. You, can, you don't need to show up in an office. All the you don't have to wear pants. Yeah. <laughs> you just, uh, as long as you deliver your script on the date that it's due, um, you can work at your own pace and your own schedule, and if you're the kind of person who just likes to sleep till noon and work until three in the morning, um, that's great. Yes, it's just kind of wonderful. And that, and that is a point. Being on time with your work, and your work being good, is the most important thing. It's being late is to make bad. your deadlines. was action versus action comedy or adventure comedy. Right? There are all kinds of different areas within animation. Preschool, um, you know, uh, four to six, six to eleven, boy shows, girl shows, educational shows, action, comedy, and this new term, action comedy. And what happens is we see a pendulum. Sometimes everything on the air is action. It's all superheroes and G.I. Joe and that kind of thing, and there are no comedies. And then the pendulum starts to swing, and it'll move towards more and more comedies. And eventually the pendulum goes back. When you've been at it for a long time, you see it go back and forth several times. And it also changes by gender and also by age. Sometimes it's like the younger shows just seem to dominate, and sometimes the um, the more you know, like female centric or girl centric kinds of shows uh, just sort of take the forefront. Right, and when I say girl shows, that's just the industry term for shows aimed at young girls, just like boy shows. Um, but right now the pendulum is strongly over on the comedy side, and there's pretty much no straight action shows. There are a couple, but it's almost all comedy or comedy action to the point where Cartoon Network has renamed their action department action comedy. And they call the other side comedy comedy. <laughs> uh, we had a, I was on a panel on uh, Saturday with one of the executives from Cartoon Network who described it exactly that way. Comedy comedy and action comedy. Schedule too. See, the, there's a problem with animation in that if you if you write a script, a half hour script today, the absolute soonest you could possibly see it would be six months from now. So you have exactly and more likely more nine, likely nine, nine, months. nine months. So you have these executives making decisions based on oh you know Green Lantern's not doing well right now. Let's never do another action show again, and let's make it let's make the next Green Lantern a, a, a comedic version of it. The funny animal version with the Green Lantern core, Corpse. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's look, look at Teen Titans. Teen Titans was an action-adventure show. Now it's Teen Titans Go, which is basically a comedy, and by the way, there are heroes in it. But there isn't really much else making an action-adventure show. To be fair, though, when it comes to action-adventure shows, I don't know that two of them have had the same tone. I mean, every show has its own unique voice, and what you have to be able to do is be adaptable and be receptive and have a really good ear for what makes each show unique. Because if you look at Batman the Animated Series, that was dark and very serious. And there were lots of comedic uh, uh, elements to it, like dark twisted humor like with the Joker and stuff, but basically it's a pretty dark show. And if you look at X-Men, it was also very, very dark and serious, but in a very different kind of angsty way. And 
you look at Spider-Man, Spider-Man had a lot more fun to it. And if you look at Ghostbusters, um, the Ghostbusters series I worked on was kind of like, it was more dramatic and spooky with a lot of character humor in it. Whereas I'm pretty sure the version that, that, that uh, Craig worked on uh, had a lot more of its weight in the funny, even right. though the stories had a lot of action in it. Right. So we, were, we were an adventure show, but we were a comedy adventure show just the way the original Ghostbusters movies were comedy in that adventure world. So every show has very much its unique tone. Uh, no, no two shows really have the same tone, and so you need to be very, very adaptable and have a very good ear for what it is they're looking for. That's, that's the absolute key. And um, in 90% of the, of the cases, you're going to have to or be asked to submit a writing sample. And, you know, get it, if you have something close to the sort of basic tone of that show, whether it's more comedic or more action, what the story editor or executives is going to look for is are you writing in the context of what that show is, not in the context of what their show. So you can write a great Simpsons, you know, spec script, and you might even get hired on another show, but they don't want you to do Simpsons type of dialogue. You got, they just know that, they want to know that you can get a show and then, Which you know, translate really that. I mean, a writer can write, you know, because usually with and it, smart and it, people. It used to be that they want to see a sample because they want to know you can, understand the format, you could write a script that was coherent, told a story, etc. But it didn't have to be exactly in the same tone area because they knew if you could if you were a good writer you could adapt. Today, and this applies to live action television as just as much as to animation, they want to see as close a sample as possible. Not the same show necessarily or, and probably not, but at least this is a comedy, we want to see a comedy. This is an adventure comedy, we want to see an adventure comedy. This is an action adventure, we want to see action adventure. They want to see something very close. And you're going to have to show samples. So you're going to have to write scripts that are in whatever areas you're hoping to work in. I have found that in animation there's a huge advantage in that if you're trying to write a spec script in live action, people want to know that you can write their show. So if you write um, a great Star Trek script and you're writing and you submit it to Babylon 5, it's like, well, sure, you can write Star Trek, but can you write Babylon 5? It really is that specific and that obnoxious. Whereas in animation, if you write a script like a Batman script, it's like, well, you really got Batman's voice, right? You really, you know, so we can, we can rely on us to a certain degree that you'll get our voice too. We don't just assume you can only write Batman. So I always considered animation to be a little friendlier in that regard. Also, um, you might take a look at it and consider the friendliness um, that there is not quite as much ageism in employment in animation writing. Um, in live action, it's like, well, you know, who's, who's the latest 25 year old writer? Let's hire them. In animation, because the audience is 25, in animation, well, you can't really hire a nine year old writer. So you're Although you'd think. <laughs> may think like nine-year-olds, but, uh, boy. <laughs> no, you'd, you'd, you'd think reading some of the scripts they were written by nine-year-olds is... Yeah. And if you have a sample script, you know, they might ask for a second one to show two sides, which is, you know, maybe a preschool and an action adventure. The thing is, your sample, make sure it's really good. I mean, this is your shot, and that's going to open a lot of doors, or it's going to have them say, oh, it's, it's okay, I've seen better. So, I mean, I don't know the magic secret to writing a a killer sample, but it's worth the extra time and getting with your knowledgeable friends and making it as good as you can. Because you may not get a second shot with that person that reads it. And the person who asked about transitioning from live action features to animated features, the short answer is it's almost impossible. The fact is that a lot of live action writers have written animated features but they were people that, typically it's at Disney, and Disney went to them and said, we want you to now write an animated feature. And by the way, we'll only pay you half of what you usually get for um, live action. And that, that's in fact, was the rule at Disney. If your quote on a live action feature was making up a number of $100,000, 
they give you fifty thousand dollars. It's because the animated movies make so much less than the uh, features do. But um, it's it's their most animated features are developed in house at a studio. Very few of them are pitched from outside. Maybe some of the independent animation companies will develop their own and might take pitches on features, but almost no animated features that I'm aware of have been pitched from outside. Plus they know probably 10 years down the line which ones they're going to use because it takes what, three years to make a movie or something. Although the Disney used to do this amazing thing called the Gong Show, where was it on Fridays or was it like once a month? <coughs> but they would they would have the executives in an audience and then anybody working in the company. Right, but that was you, the Gong Show was anyone who was working at Disney could pitch an idea, but you had to already be working at Disney. Right, but but, but that I, isn't someone from outside. I understand, but I'm saying it was a really great opportunity at some point that they had that if you worked at the company, you had a chance to pitch an idea. And I thought that was kind of swell when they were doing that. I know somebody who became a professional writer by pitching an idea to them. He pitched two words, and they bought it. Hmm. Those two words were Marco Polo. Uh, I would do that. But you guys want to know, you're interested in writing for animated TV. How do I get from where I'm sitting here to writing a Batman episode, right? So, that's an excellent question. Great <laughs> question you just asked yourself, Dean. Well, not, not Batman specifically, but you know, basically, how do I start, right? What do I do? Look at cartoons, get a hold of some scripts. You can download them from you know, Google, whatever. There's always scripts to look at. Look at the formatting. See how technical the writing is. An animation script will be almost twice the length the, the amount of pages as a sitcom script. The sitcoms are basically like plays, runs of dialogue, you do almost no stage direction. In animation, depending on what show you're working for, you may have to break it down into close up on Gambit's hand, widen out to yeah. show this in the background, SFX, you're writing the music cues, you're writing every bit of stage direction, everything that's seen and heard, every sound effect, to varying degrees on different shows, you're gonna write in that script. And when I first looked at an animation script, it looked to me like a technical document. And I said, what the hell is SFX and you know, MOS or CU close-up? And that's all really easy stuff to learn. It's jargon, but you have to think in terms of if you were describing the panels of a comic book, how does, how does an artist draw each of these things in succession in a linear fashion, not that it all happens you know, at the same time. So you have to show that you have a visual sense, that you understand that it's boarded into a storyboard like a comic book, and then it's taken from there and animated. That's why they're so long. The, the two extremes, I, I literally went from one to the other in the course of a weekend, where what you just described was Spider-Man, where the, the director would kind of go, well, I don't know how you can do this. And they'd have to write <laughs> every punch. So the next day when I'm with Batman, it's like, don't worry about that. Just mm -hmm. write a regular script. I was writing tended to be like it was earlier when they were doing them much more. Um, well, here, here's the thing: when you first start writing screenplays, if you just you know don't know anything about the screenplay format, one of the one of the cardinal sins is trying to direct from the page, and it's a sign of an amateur if you do that. What you're supposed to do is write in what's called master scene, where you say exterior ballpark, and then you just describe this, the, the setting in various terms, and then it's all dialogue unless something is absolutely essential mention in a descriptive paragraph. Uh, and, you know, if you direct from the page in live action, it is the sign of an amateur. You don't know what you're doing. In animation, if you don't direct from the page, you haven't done your job. And so it's a lot more work, but the great thing is you get to direct from the page, and if you write an episode and it gets produced, it looks like what you wrote, and that feels like a trillion dollars. If you're writing for a sitcom, I knew somebody who wrote an episode of a show, and it was like, yeah, they used three lines of my dialogue. And their name was the writer. They, you know, they got the full credit and everything. But they got three lines of dialogue. We get shot breakdowns, we get dialogue, we get it just like we wrote it, and it feels amazing. 
Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember all the questions that came all up here. Maybe for the set of questions. Okay. Uh, all right. My my brain is Swiss cheese after three days of convention. So questions we didn't get to. Anyone want to? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was asking about since the days of kind of Adult Swim and uh, Comedy Central, and even the Batman animated series and stuff, have things become more self-aware, more complex? Because the story's gotten more, like if you watch SpongeBob, it's almost layered, so the kids are laughing, but the parents are chuckling too. Have things changed uh, okay. all throughout? The goal on most shows is to have something that parents can find entertaining and not want to shoot themselves when their kid watches it for the 14th time. There's nothing new about that. No, no, no. That's, that's not new. It, well, the Looney Tunes do oh, from the 30s were like that. Looney Tunes great for adults, actually, but that's, yeah. a different, that's a different point. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you're writing a show, you, you want to entertain the, the, the intended audience, but you also want to reach beyond that, particularly if it's a very, very young audience. Um, you all want to put some things in there that not the entire audience will get, but that other people will get too. So you'll have jokes that adults will get and the kids but, won't. But I think what also is happening is modern tastes are changing. That's, you see it in I'm sitcoms, saying. you see it in movies. The type of jokes are a little bit different. But you know, the thing is in the 50s, there was one type and in the 60s and in the 70s. And so you're just, we're just seeing a continual change to modern tastes. And remember the people making the decisions are all in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, not nine. So if you know if they were all nine-year-olds making the decisions, everything would be about burping and farting, and you know. Uh, Although unfortunately, many executives sort of look at it like this is what the kids like these days, so that's what we're going to go with. And so you wind up with burping and farting jokes um, because people think that's what kids want, and they may or may not be ready. Adult, adult Swim is its own genre, you know, there's stuff you can't, you just can't get away with on daytime with that, and even, you know, Family Guy and that stuff is more mature than daytime. But yeah, like the Phineas and Ferbs and the Spongebob's, they definitely use sort of sophisticated stuff. You're, you're often or almost always limited, you know, even if a kid is like a kid superhero, if he rides a bike, he's got to wear a helmet. You know, there's a lot of limitations and stuff. If a guy has a gun, they'll tell you, well, we can't do that, it's imitable. But if he gets a really big gun and it shoots lasers or something like that, you know, it's always they want a bigger gun. The, the idea being that they want to present stuff that a kid is not going to find around the house, you know, that's imitatable, even if it's a light socket, you know. You watch an old Popeye cartoon, the first 10 seconds, there'll be about 30 things you could never do in a modern TV show. Bugs Bunny, I mean, they have all the stuff with Elmer Fudd with guns and stuff, and it's like, you know, Elmer Fudd these days would not be a hunter, he would be something else. Looking for healthy snacks, you know. <laughs> you know, they can't, we can't have kids eating cookies or carrots. Cookie Monster or can't eat cookies anymore. What the hell's going on? Cookie about? Monster <laughs> can eat cookies, he just also has to have healthy snacks. Right. He has to have both. When I was on Pooh this last version, they said, one of the notes was, does Pooh have to eat so much honey? I mean, it was, it was an episode about him eating too much so he gets stuck in a log, you know, but it's like, that's who he is. That's his, you know, so you, you get crazy notes like in any job where your does boss Does he have to steal a picnic basket? Can't he earn one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's we, right. um, later this month, just plugging another event, um, I'm doing a panel for the organization Women in Animation called Holy Bleep Batman Censorship and Animation. And it's all about broadcast standards and practice notes, sponsor notes, all the kinds of things we get told you can't do that um, because you know, it'll scare a kid or it's, they'll think it's blasphemous or it's imitatable and kids will somehow be able to do it. So if you want, if you were interested in that, you can look on the Women in Animation Facebook page and they'll have the dates and the details and all that. But even in censorship, there's a wide, wide range of, of what, they're, what they'll tell you to do. I, uh, I worked on Static Shock where it was exactly what you're describing, heavily censored. And then the next day when I was working on Justice League, we got a note from uh, Cartoon Network saying, hey, you know that scene where Aquaman has to cut off his own hand to get out of the trap? 
Are you actually going to show the hand being cut off on screen? He said, well, no, we, we weren't thinking about that. And I said, good, that's the only way to know. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Cartoon Network, good. Cartoon Network, yeah. Good. Did, did Aquaman have the ability to regrow his hand? No, he has that hook. He has a hook. Oh, he's got a hook. Well, I didn't know if the new one had him with the hook, so... Also, if you guys are an artist, you know, and you've got some like a comic book idea or a series idea, you might want to team up with the writer if you don't think you've got the chops to do that. And that's all. That's also a good way. But uh, you know, no, no, studios tend to like things that have existed in other medium because somebody already said yes, or there's a proven audience, and you're not just some guy with a suit or woman. So if you have a you know a short film, if you got a comic book you self-published, if you got a line of greeting cards, if you've, you know, designed a toy, you know, any of those things I think will get you a meeting. You can actually call up these studios and um, with any luck you could get a meeting with somebody who can uh, give you a shot, especially Nickelodeon and, and Cartoon Network, I'd say, are the most friendly to that. Yeah, Nick has a program where they let people come pitch. They did it at Comic Con for, a sh for shorts. Not a word yet about agents. agents. Because the less said, the better. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it does help to have an agent, a manager, or an attorney to represent you. They can help you get in the door at a lot of places, and they can help you if you are. Uh, this is really with pitching. Uh, well, ag managers and attorneys is more for pitching series concepts, getting individual jobs. Agents may know the shows that are open or may not, um, or you may you can usually go in and pitch on them as well. Yeah, I didn't have to get an agent until I got hired on staff at Disney. I mean, my first freelance jobs. But when I sat down with Disney, they actually were offering me a job, but I talked to them and they said, "We don't want to talk to you anymore. To get an agent, some of that's legal, some of it's because it's just the way it is. But you still don't have to do the same work to get an agent. You have to have a, a great sample or something." that they'll want to take you on as a client, you know, okay. so think about it. They don't want a sample, they want to know that you've been hired. Until you've sold three episodes, they don't want to hear from you. Sorry. And, that's, and if you disagree with me, say so. No, it's the way things are now. But if you've got like comic books and stuff you've created and published, then agents will talk to you as well. In, in film school, I mean, a long time ago, granted, we, we had agents coming in and, and asking, you know, like, which one of you like an agent, yep. and now it's completely changed, and you have to pay to get an agent, and then, like, well, where's my work? Well, that's something you have to find. Yeah, if you sign with a major agency, what you get is a major agency. You don't get an agent out there working his ass off for you. What you can say is, yeah, I'm with such and such an agency, and that will give you the street cred for them to want to either talk to you or read one of your samples, but having an agent in and of itself um, does not guarantee you work on any level. It's really premature to talk about agents, uh, unless then you... why did you bring it up? I, I brought, didn't bring it up. It oh, was, I'm sorry. People, damn, people, 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 brought it up. people who are starting out... I said the less said, the better. <laughs> you're right, you're right. People who are starting out might think that an agent would be helpful, and we've now burst that bubble. That's right. Okay, other questions before we run out of time? Yeah. Pitching. Oh, pitching. Pitching, okay. Um, pitching episodes in animation, which works differently than in live action. Typically, once you know about a show, they'll give you a copy of the show's Bible that tells you all about the show and the characters and the world. And then you have to write up what are called premises. They used to be a paragraph that said, oh, let's have... Um, Barbie go and get a job as an astronaut. Right. And you know, you know, you've got like four to eight sentences where you talk generally about the episode. And if they liked it, they said, okay, this is a great premise. Go to outline and they would pay you for the outline. Now I see shows that want a one to two page fully worked out story that they do not pay you for as the premise. And sometimes they'll have you rewrite it several times with still no promise that they'll ever hire you or pay you. 
they want more and more complete work. I mean, is that what you guys have been seeing? Well, it's, all, it's all over the map right now. Actually, Nickelodeon is paying for premises now. Like, if I, and I don't know why, but if you go, you'll sign a thing that says, well, you, you're going to give us five premises, and it's just a paragraph, and we're going to pay you 100 bucks to go away. You know, or, or, or they'll hire you to keep going. But I mean, that's still an improvement over usually you pitch premises to shows and they might even ask you to rewrite it and they're still not paying you. I'm sure it's to protect their own behind, but um, I think it really varies. I mean, as a story editor on a show, I want to hear something that's going to catch my ear and to show me that you've got some fresh ideas that we haven't done. I don't need a long thing. Now, at that point, you might be asked to write a long premise, but in my personal ethics, you know, as soon as I tell somebody to rewrite something, I'm, I'm committing to them that they're gonna do an episode, even if, even if I have to write it all myself. Thank so. you, I'd like to address that too. Thank you, that's exactly right. Um, if, if I have somebody deliver a premise to me, and I'm a story editor, I've had the conversations with the network, I've had the conversations with the producers, I know what they're looking for, so if you give me a premise and it's not singing on key, but I like the idea, I'll rewrite it, so that the, pre to the producers in the network will like it because I know what they're looking for. I'm not going to make you keep guessing. Um, what I present is when story you present a premise to a, a story editor, it's like a page, page and a half, whatever, they're like, hey, rewrite this. And I'm like, I'll rewrite it. They'll give me some notes or whatever. And they say, rewrite it again. Um, if they ask for more than one rewrite and they're not guaranteeing you work, you have my permission to punch them in the face. <laughs> It just tells them, Bob Skier said I should do this. Look, if you, and if then you, punch him again. If you, if you all are hearing some bitterness here, it's because a lot of animation isn't covered by the union it should be covered by, which is the Writers Guild. Just to give you one example to, to go back with what you were talking about, the Writers Guild has a deal, what's called a two-meeting deal, which is that when I went in to pitch a Knight Rider episode, um, I didn't know if they were going to like it or not, they called me back for a second meeting, and by guild rules, I had to be paid for that story. That was my first TV ride. That's what happens when you have good guild representing you. What happens, uh, what Bob described is what happens when there's either no guild or, um, shall we say, a guild or a union that's and, not and quite just, as good. Just as an explanation, there's a lot of animation is done non-union. This is both features and TV, especially TV. Some of it is done under the Animation Guild, which is a local of IATSE, um, and some animation is done under the Writers Guild. You have much more protections when it's under the Writers Guild. Um, done under the Animation Guild, there is a guild minimum, and you do get contributions towards your pension and health fund, but there's very little in the way of protection um, in terms of being mistreated, being asked to do a continuous rewrites, and of course, non-union, there are none. But and no credit arbitration either. And yeah, you, no, there's, there's not even a jealous non-union. No, 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 no. There is. There are. When I say there are none, there are no protections. Oh yeah, no. Um, but ninety-nine percent of what you're going to be pitching to for daytime is not going to be WGA. If it might be local eight thirty nine, which is the cartoonist union, or it might be non-union. I, I just want to just say one thing. You know, I agree that you should punch the guy or whatever if you ask for a rewrite. But if you're hungry, and you know, we've all been there, and if you really want the gig, and you think that if I am so persistent that I'll write this a third time, and you know, you can do it, and you might get the job, then you might write it off to experience, or you might show them something. You know, it's like anything else. If you're really hungry, you're willing to do it sometimes. I'm not saying it's right or it's ideal. For people like us who've done it for a long time, we might say, this isn't really kosher, and it's not worth it, but you know, if you're trying to get in the Depends door. Depends on how much you need the work. No one's going to think less of you for it, for having done it, because you needed the work, you know, it's. Right, but I'm, I'm taking focus away from, you know, what you're willing to do for a job, and more toward the person that you're pitching to is a story editor. And if you have a story editor that you're pitching to, and he takes a premise and says, okay, I'm gonna work this and see if I can sell it for you, or I need you to rewrite this so it's a little bit more a model and then I'll see what I can do. You're working with somebody fairly professional. 
if you have somebody who's making you do third and fourth rewrites on something, you're working on, you're, you're, you're dealing with a jerk off and, you know, they're abusing you. Some, and that's very simple. Some story editors take the title story editor to heart and others are more traffic cops. They'll receive the stuff from you, they'll send it to someone else, they'll give you back the notes they get from the other person and don't actually take an active hand in what they, in, in the process. Other story editors, when I'm a story editor, Bob I know does this and I'm sure Stan and Dean do it as well. Actually, Dean, you, I've worked with you on, so I know you do it as well. Get involved in it and say, okay, don't worry about this note, and, let me, let me goose this a little to make it a little closer to what they're looking for and that sort of thing. And that's really the kind of story editor you hope to work with. Right. And there is also the equivalent, if anybody here is in acting, of a cattle call where they'll call a ton of writers in, tell them about the show they did some Smurfs when I started. 50 people in a room and we're going back in time this season. Good luck. You know, and they'll just take, Clifford used to do that, and just take premises from everyone. Very rarely would you be asked to rewrite, but you know, then they're just... If they no, call no, in no. more people into a room than there are assignments, mm -hmm. it's a cattle call. Mm -hmm. And the way you can tell it's a cattle call, aside from that is, they will begin the meeting by telling you, this is not a cattle call. <laughs> but but, but the, the cautionary, or the opposite cautionary here, that, that was my experience with Smurfs. I'm looking at, around at all these seasoned writers. I'd written like two scripts, and they said it was about mythology, and I was working a temp job, I wrote all, all these premises, long and funny, but totally out of whack, and I called them from a phone booth, and everybody else had dropped off their stuff at the front desk as they'd asked. I said, look, I'm, I'm break for my temp job, can I just come down and pitch you in person? And I did that, and they were four very tired looking people who hadn't seen anybody in a long time, and they were laughing, I was reading these premises out loud, they called me back to come the next week, they said we can't use these, but do it again. The second week again, I missed the mark, and but they said, you know, the stuff you've done is so good, we're gonna pay you, we've never done this before, we're gonna pay you for the premises, just the work you did on it. And finally, they just hired me for like four assignments, and you know, it was just because I got in front of their face, and you know, they liked it, and not everybody did it. So anytime you could get into somebody's face, and you know, put a face to the name and make them laugh, or make some personal connection, good thing. Okay, any, any other, any last question before we're out of time? Okay, you again. Yeah. Um, copywriting. Copywriting. Yeah, how would you make sure that your work, that you're pushing your lines or drama doesn't get stolen? The short answer is, don't worry about it. First off, if you only have one idea, you're in the wrong business. Second, it's very rare that, while it does occasionally happen, it's rare that someone's actually gonna say, why, that was a great idea that guy pitched, let me have someone else write it. If they gotta pay someone to write it, they might as well pay the person whose idea it was. The problem comes in that you say, the Smurfs join a circus, but probably 12 other people have pitched Smurfs join a circus. And just because they do an episode where it's the Smurfs join a circus, it may not be really based on your pitch of it. It may be based on the pitch of someone they either have faith in because they've worked with them a bunch of times or their particular take on it. But it ha stealing ideas at that level happens so rarely that it, it's not worth really worrying about. The, the bigger problem is the fear that of, of those people who Smurfs join the circus, they're going to sue you because, well, I handed you, you know, I handed you, and that's why they have all these forms that you have to sign saying, basically, you give up, you give up all your rights. You know, you show them. Yeah, it, but, you know, it, it really is such a small thing that r occurs so rarely, and, and I, I mean, I can give you examples of where I, I pitched on a live action show, and Two minutes into the pitch, they all, all the producers looked back and forth and at each other, and they said, we're gonna stop you because we're doing this show. We just finished shooting this episode, 
and it sounds exactly like what you were saying. And they said, but by the way, how does it end exactly? No, no, they, they, no, no, no. It was going on the air in two weeks. Uh, there was no way, this was, this was a, a Star Trek The Next Generation. No, Deep Space Nine. Oh, Deep Space Nine, you're right. Actually, um, and coincidentally, the same exact thing happened to me on the same exact show. Now, but I'm, I mean, there was no physical possible way they could yeah. have ripped off my pitch. Or mine, they were in post. Yeah, I mean, they were already, <laughs> were already way too long. And they, and they even, and they asked me, would I mind telling them, because they were curious how close it was. My pitch was beat for beat the same show they did, except they told me I had a better ending. <laughs> Which you think would make you, them invite you back and give you an assignment. You think that alone would make them say, hey, you should work on our show. But no, that was not the case. <laughs> but the, but the thing, thing is, there, that kind of stuff happens, and it, it's just so rare on that kind of level. If they're hiring freelancers to write scripts, there's no point, and, and to come in and pitch, there's no point ripping them off for an idea. Someone's gonna get the paltry amount of money they're paying to write the script. Might as well have the guy who came, or the woman who came up with the idea. It's, it's really not something to worry about too much. Um, okay, the, the guy in the back had his hand up earlier, so we'll take that. Uh, I heard that, I remember my, that animators can get laid off. Is that true? Like, is it difficult to get, get the job? It's the 21st century. Everyone gets laid off. So we're, we're always between jobs. I mean, even if you're attached to a show, to the run of the show, you're, we're always between jobs. You're always looking. Yeah, I mean, there's people, no job security in this at all. Yeah, people generally are hired at most for run of show, not forever. It's not, and you go to you go find some other show to work on, or at some other studio. It, it, it's not a I'm going to be working for Ford for the next 40 years, and Ford doesn't keep you for the next 40 years anymore either. <laughs> we have a downturn. We're laying everybody off. Let's say if I'm a new writer. you think is a great idea, pitch it first. Don't say, after they hire me for one thing, I'll give them my great idea. <laughs> Make sure they hire you. Pitch the great idea. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Um, but if you have any more questions, you can take us afterwards and just sort of talk to us in the hall. Okay, you know, thank I'll, you very you much. You can talk to Craig in the hall. <laughs>